thank you for being here, Patrick. No better. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you. Could you tell me a bit about the company you are working for? Uh, what do you do? Yeah, uh, I work for Adyad. We're a bank, we're a payments company. We, we do a lot of stuff. The main thing is allowing our merchants to get paid. That'd be kind of the main thing. Um, if you've come across the term fintech, then it's it's in that vein. So I started there as a technical writer when we were only three people on the team. I guess in that time, I've kind of helped us change how we approach documentation. So now, yeah, as a result, now I am working as a project manager here for our DocOps uh, group, enabling DocOps. Okay. What sort of documentation do you create? Is it for end users or for developers? For both. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. so I thought I could, uh, it's developer facing uh, documentation mostly, but like um, a lot of our products are APIs. So there's a lot of uh, API doc focus. There's a lot of uh, stuff like using Swagger and stuff to generate docs. And uh, then we have user guides, we have integration guides, we have stuff for people that are in uh, point of sale situations like people that are in shops that have uh, devices and that kind of thing it runs the gamut all of them all of the types of that and how big is uh, your technical writing team at the moment keeps changing but we are still 15 uh but yeah there's going to be more coming again but yeah it's still rather big there's seven technical writers three developers two of us in doing doc up stuff and then uh, one product designer uh, as well as our team lead and uh, product owner so all right yeah so you have developers who are also um their work is dedicated to full-time to technical writing yeah uh, yeah 100 percent um so we have front-end developers, we have back-end developers, they are working on stuff like our CMS, they're working on stuff like the the front-end of uh, the documentation portal, as it were. And uh, then we also, we have developers working with stock so me, kind of, I call myself a developer, Eh, and uh, I'm Tyne, who is the, the main engineer for Okay, and uh, could you explain the term doc ops? Yeah, so this is like you could unravel and have a full, probably hour long discussion about it, but it's an approach to documentation. So if you've come across the idea of DevOps, a lot of it is about developers taking ownership for uh, process, for collaboration, but it's also about using automation, uh, continuous delivery, that kind of stuff. From a writer point of view, doc ops, it's, it's approaching documentation in the same way. It's customer-centric, developing docs for user in mind, doing collaborative authoring, so you have to make sure that other people all interact in one platform, let's say. There's a lot about content strategy, uh, what you actually document and uh, where you document it. Avoiding content silos or breaking down content silos because they tend to emerge over the course of having uh, a lot of documentation. So yeah, merging all that stuff in one place. Customer integration is a big part of it as well. So like uh, stuff like getting feedback from customers, so having mechanisms for that or, or suggestion flows, that kind of stuff. What we do mostly is deployment, automated testing and deployment. So that's a big part of it as well. So stuff like running quality checks on our documentation and then actually publishing the documentation, all of that. What else comes into the remit? You could you could argue analytics goes in there. So like actually trying to figure out who's reading the doc, you know, monitoring the content, seeing, seeing what they're doing with the doc. And yeah, a lot of it is also kind of, yeah, it's tied up with docs as code, I guess we can get to that. But uh, yeah, using the same tools as developers, stuff like Jenkins, IDs, our role as the doc ops group within the documentation team is to enable all of these providing tools, like I mentioned, for publishing or for quality checks. Originally it came from CA Technologies, kind of applying DevOps to Doc Ops, but then I think that, yeah, it, it's growing a bit and it's always, like everything else, its definition will change over time. <laughs> what skills are required to work in Doc Ops? For me, personally, I think a developer who has a really good documentation focus someone who has done both the jobs of developer and technical writer would be fantastic i think it's important that you have someone who understands docs or at least can be converted into a documentarian because like they're gonna they're gonna evangelize more they're gonna believe in it more they're gonna be more interested in actually producing something they're gonna start thinking from the perspective of the user which a lot of the time for our tools ends up being technical writers so you need to understand you know, how they work um so like in that stage the engineer that i work with is time time math and he uh when he started he was like an intern came from we have an internal intern kind of uh program 
And uh, he, as far as I know, other than using docs, he wasn't really, you know, a, a crazy docs expert or anything, but he really got into the team and got into the idea of documentation, really kind of did a lot of work to understand what was needed from him, you know, that for me would be the main thing. Uh, someone who's a pretty sharp developer, at least, you know, when it comes to Python, a, l a lot of the stuff we're using, it's, you know, it, it, we use Pandas, we use some of the NLP libraries, that kind of stuff. We're starting to do fancier things with those. The idea is like, or my great dream is two things. One is to automate uh, Microsoft style guide such that you just run it on a page and it tells you where it's broken. But we are doing that as I speak. And uh, there's a lot of rules in there and they're not very well documented, ironically, for, <laughs> or at least they're documented well if you're a human, but not great if you're uh, an algorithm trying to figure out what they mean. But uh, we've done a lot that way. Um, the other thing is uh, I want to expand on a thing that I came across. I'm, I'm studying for a master's at the moment and uh, I want to identify candidates for reuse within our documentation. So using fuzzy logic. Um, now I say all these things, but they're all words that I've read in other places that I have only a tenuous grasp on. So the idea then is I try and find engineers or people that are going to be able to put that stuff into practice. People that are smart, mm. surround myself with them, hope that they lift the, uh, the boat. <laughs> Sounds like some pretty interesting project. I think it's uh, it's an area of doc that has a lot of exciting stuff that you can do. And uh, I heard in one of your interviews that uh, previously we were using Confluence for documentation, yeah? Yeah. How have you managed the move to, um, to documentation as code? And actually, let's first quickly mention documentation as uh, code. Uh, so we're so using the same sort of flow as, as uh, programmers. Yeah, I mean, it's... Gosh, it, it, it's a little bit more than just that too, but Docs as Code is something that a lady called Anne Gentle came up with. She wrote a book on it, um, or at least she, she documented it enough. I'm sure people are already doing it, but uh, the idea is that you approach documentation, like the, the processes around documentation, like their code, as well as the actual docs where you're hosting it and all that. So yeah, the argument, I guess, is that developers are going to be more likely to want to interact with the documentation because they're used to the different tools they're using, the, the formats, stuff like uh, Markdown and Git. So it's easier to get them to collaborate. How easy or difficult was for your technical writers to make the switch? Going from uh, going from Confluence to Docs as Code. So when we were in Confluence, we were a smaller team. When we moved to Docs as Code, it was kind of before we expanded so much but we still had there was a few people probably that were there in the crossover that, that came in to be honest it was pretty relatively painless or at least the amount of pain that we were kind of enduring using confluence was great enough that it seemed painless in in contrast yeah i mean not to go off on confluence or anything that it does certain things really well it's very handy if you are in a very small team especially like it, it you know, it, it kind of does what it says on the tin, but it really doesn't meet the needs of technical writers out of the box. It, it, in fact, it like abstracts away a lot of the content from the author. So you're, you're, you're kind of being forced to use plugins to do certain stuff or everything is hosted in a database. You, you can't just run easily tests on, on, on this, that kind of stuff. It, it makes it a little more difficult. So from our point of view, it was kind of like, none of this is particularly easy to interact with. It's okay, but it isn't any easier than if we just had our IDE or if we had a, another editor or what have you. But where they're actually storing the docs and the way they're doing that is problematic and it makes it harder to, to do interesting stuff with the docs. And stuff. Easy, but also hard. <laughs> so do you use some interface right now for writing documentation? Yeah, like, um, so it depends on different people in the team use different stuff, obviously. We are kind of moving towards standardizing that a bit more as well, but we have a web editor that uh, it's provided by Grav CMS, the people who design the CMS for using. I pick Atom usually, but IntelliJ is also popular. So they're the two main ones that people are using on the team. Okay. Where in the product development cycle, the technical writing comes? This is like, it's not a non-answer, but like it should pretty much exist at every stage because if 
the DDLC, like the documentation development life cycle, let's say, should run with the product cycle, but you can't do it all at the start because the product doesn't exist. But you can't do it all in the middle because things can change right up until the release. So you can't do it all at the end because you're going to have to stuff everything in and you've got no time, right? So it ends up being this kind of, if, you, if you're in an agile setting anyway, you the best approach, I think, is to just try and iterate in time and have good prioritization and good planning. You know, there's, there's not really a one size fits all solution that yeah everyone can apply but uh being able to analyze upcoming features and products planning and prioritizing it such that the writers aren't working in something that isn't coming out for ages or you know that they're not waiting for ages for updates from developers to actually write a document which sometimes can be the case right if you start a bit too early or, or uh, you know so it's, it's probably inevitable to some degree you're always going to have a bit of you know slack or trying to trying to manage things but that's where you're having good uh like good prioritization and planning comes in. i also wanted to ask you some questions about remote work how easy or difficult it was for you to shift and actually are you still working from home yes yeah yeah we're definitely working <laughs> working from home uh so for the last year as well i've got more now it's a year and a month Netherlands has had really high case levels. It's a small place, it's very densely populated, so you get you get uh, yeah, high numbers and that kind of stuff. For me personally, it wasn't that difficult to shift to remote work because I did it before when I used to live in Ireland. I was working on a remote team in America, but as well as that, like yeah, it actually kind of made life a bit easier because I have a small dog who I can look after a bit easier. Um, I don't have kids who are driving me mental all day, which I know some people do have, and, and then they want to be in the office, right? But uh, yeah, like the, the biggest challenge is probably more like the just like not being able to see people, not being able to walk up to people directly, not being able to just ask them a question without, you know, sending an IM or what have you. And people have been pretty good at, at keeping up with you and actually replying to messages, but still you, you kind of miss seeing people. I think um, yeah, just general malaise and anxiety around coronavirus itself where you're just worried and tired and all of that stuff. Yes, yes, I think that's the case everywhere at the moment, isn't yeah, it? I was wondering if um, the remote work influenced the processes you had in place before in any way? Yeah, not much. I think like um, walking up to people that bit. So not being able to just, yeah, there's something after going wrong with Jenkins. Ah, oh, okay, well, I'll walk up to my colleague in, in that team because he can answer this question instead you're kind of you're messaging people and it's a little less um personable let's say sometimes you kind of feel like oh i'm really giving this person the impression that i'm only messaging them when things go wrong and you kind of but that's part of it unfortunately whereas at least when you come up you can kind of you know go, oh what's that on your screen oh that's funny oh did you see this the other day okay anyway here's the horrible thing that i've ever done so yeah it, um i think that's a bit for me anyway where process has changed a bit a lot more messaging a lot more relying on you track and that kind of stuff rather than uh yeah the face-to-face -face kind of collaboration that we used to have i have two more questions if you would have any advice about like in improving the searchability we're using Elasticsearch to some degree, I know, but uh, yeah, as far as the actual ins and outs of it, I haven't really looked into it. Um, I know that people use stuff like tagging, so it makes pages work a bit better. You can do that and stuff like the way we're doing it, I believe, anyway. The last time I checked, things like having keywords in, defined in YAML uh, as part of your, your markdown file, let's say. And then when someone searches for them, if you have a good enough uh, search index and all that, you can associate pages with these tags and then you can arrange in terms of popularity and all, all that kind of stuff. I would say probably the best bet is to get some third party solution like Elasticsearch that will make life easier that way and mm -hmm. not trying to build your own mm -hmm. search solutions. And uh, in terms of analytics? Yeah. So one thing we use is Google Analytics, which obviously I guess everyone is using it. But um, what you're kind of looking for are trends. Uh, you're looking at pages that are, let's say, not viewed, pages that are highly viewed. So you can use that kind of stuff to determine what pages should, what kind of orders you should use, what pages mm -hmm. should be presented first, what pages should be very prominent because people are, are definitely going to want to use them. You can also use it to launch investigations into things like, uh, we notice this page isn't highly trafficked, but it really should be. Why? What is, is it? What is it about this page? Or it is highly trafficked, but yeah, eighty percent of the people get there and they bounce immediately, or they they're exiting straight away, kind of thing. Um, and you know, speculation kind of versus then combining that with solid feedback 
on those pages by either getting it directly from customers or even looking at um, how people are using the pages. You know, you can analyze heat maps and stuff of the page to see what they're clicking, what they aren't clicking, what, what, what appears to be going around. That's the kind of stuff where we use analytics and monitoring for the most part. Difficult to make direct conclusions from it though, because it's all assumption. You know, you're you're kind of going, oh, we think that someone is leaving this page for this reason, but maybe they're not. Maybe they get to the page, get the information really quick and get out of there because they don't, you know, you, you can't, uh, yeah, you have to be careful with making huge changes based on these assumptions. Yeah, you are not in people's heads <laughs> and you don't no. know what, what they are thinking when they are doing certain stuff. It would make stuff. life a lot easier though. Maybe. We are getting closer there though, yeah, with, with AI yeah. and all <laughs> that. <laughs> Mind reading. <laughs> I hope not, because uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I want my thoughts out there. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's it's the age-old question. Like it's the entire question of documentation, and it's the same. You see it over and over again. But it's like, what does the user actually want? Like, what do they need? Who are we writing for? And what are their needs? You know. And a lot of the time, people will kind of jump ahead from that so you're and i've done it myself everyone has done it who works in docs you you start documenting something and you go down a rabbit hole and then you realize the person that's reading this none of this is actually relevant to them what am i doing you know and if you approach it from who is reading this what do they need to see on this page as much as you can then you know you won't go far wrong or at least it's harder to go wrong thank you very much thanks a lot for sharing your knowledge no better yeah, it's a pleasure um as i say you've seen the LinkedIn, if anyone is listening or watching this that wants to reach out and ask more questions about it, or if you want to reach out and ask more questions about it, work away. Uh, it's no bother. It's not that I know everything or anything like that, but I can at least share what I have learned in the process of doing this. 